All right, so chapter 24 continued. Last class, we looked at two case studies. We looked at the Dutch in Java. We looked at the British in where? India. And what did we say that both of them had in common when they started out? No goal of conquest. When Europeans first go to most of these places, what is their primary interest? Make money, trade. So you need to get that image of the European conquering army out of your head. That's not what's happening. It's usually a small band of European merchants, traders, businessmen, guys that are out to make money, not shoot people up. This is not Hernan Cortez versus the Aztecs. This is totally different. So, when Europeans show up, things might not play out exactly the way you think it would. However, some of them do. So, not long after Europeans show up, they have typically worked their way into the upper levels of society. It is very, very rare in many of these cases that Europeans stay in the lower levels of society for very long at all. Now, when they first show up, does everybody love them? Of course not. When they first show up in India or China or Japan, do people look at them kind of funny? Absolutely, they do look funny. But before too long, they have typically worked themselves into the upper classes because they're dealing in very expensive goods. And who are the people that have these very expensive goods? The upper class. So you kind of end up with the people you associate with. Now, when Europeans first go to these new places, they're kind of stupid. They expect that these new places will be and should be just like Europe. So like when I take students on these summer trips, guaranteed within the first two days, when we're looking for food, what do you think somebody asks for? Hamburger. Hamburger. Ooh, there's a McDonald's, can we stop? No. There's pizza, there's pizza, can we get pizza? No. You just spent thousands of dollars to come to a foreign country and you want McDonald's? No. But you're kind of hardwired that way. And I understand foreign McDonald's have different stuff and all that and blah, blah, blah. No, no. You want the cultural experience. But for most people, when you travel far away, you want some reminders of home. And so a lot of the things on this list, Europeans are going to do at first. Nick, what were you going to say? Oh, it was about the food food. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. And then you're kind of stuck with. Yeah. All right. So when Europeans come to these new places, they need a place to live. They build European style houses, which in much of Europe look like what we have here as townhouses. So tall, thin, narrow, stacked right next to each other. Now, that's great in a temperate climate because having the houses all stacked together keeps the warmth in, keeps the cold out in winter. There's less exposed area to lose heat. You know, there's less of the house to be damaged by storms and things like that. It's a pretty solid design. How do you think that works in the tropics? Oh, it's miserable. There's no airflow. Two of the four sides of your house don't have a window if you're in a townhouse, right? Unless you magically get the end unit. <laughs> Two of the four sides have no windows. It's true. So when Europeans go to these places, they build European style homes and they find out very quickly, they suck. Townhouses in the tropics, bad idea. What do you want? Right, single house, high roof, lots of open areas big windows or sometimes not even windows just like 
open areas. So like if you guys ever go to, on vacation down in the Caribbean or places like that, you'll find that the resorts or the, the bungalows or whatever, like sometimes don't even have walls. Like it's posts and a roof. Yeah. And at first you're looking at it like, wow, I feel kind of like uneasy. Like there's no walls. I don't have any privacy. People can see me. And then after the second day, you're like, oh, thank God there's no walls. I'm so hot. You're like, oh, we can feel the breeze. Okay, good. Doesn't exist yet. Well, right. Now you can get away with it a little bit better. But yeah. All right, same thing with dress. When the Europeans show up, they're wearing European clothes, which for the men means cotton or even wool, pants, tall boots, snazzy jacket, much like this, with a shirt underneath and a tie, much like this, up to your neck. Does this work in the tropics? No, it's hot. No, it's hot. And humid. And humid. And so within probably 10 minutes, if I was on spring break right now on a tropical island in the Caribbean and I was wearing this in 85 degree weather and 75% humidity, I would be sweating through at least two layers of clothing, if not three. Europeans figure out very quickly, huh, maybe we should wear different clothes. And so they, adopt, they start adopting the dress of locals. Locals wear loose fitting clothing. Uh, do you know what a sari is? Ladies, it's kind of like what you wear at the pool as a cover-up for your bathing suit. Like that real silky, just kind of like wrap around the lower half of your body. That's what a lot of the men wear in the tropics at this time. It's breezy. It's comfortable. It's cool. So Europeans start wearing these kinds of clothes. Yes, sir. Is this why we have stuff like shorts? You betcha. Fashion had to adjust. Well, it's not the only reason. I don't even know if I'd say it's one of the main reasons, but I mean, it certainly helps. But I mean, for any of you that travel, I mean, it's not like European countries don't get warm during the summer. I mean, I've been in London, it was 95. I was happy I was wearing shorts. Same with food. Europeans go to these places, they still want European food, they can't find it, they get exposed to foreign dishes. You go to England now, you find just as many Indian restaurants as you do British restaurants. <laughs> you what? It's not just Africa. It's India, it's Southeast Asia, it's China, it's all that. So this is just general behavior. No, in England today, there are more Indian restaurants than there are British ones because they so loved the culture of India when they went there, they brought it back with them. Same applies to entertainment. The local entertainment becomes what the Europeans prefer. You see them intermarry with the locals. You see them initially keep the Christian faith out because what would the church's response to all of this be? Sinners, 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 sinners. Put back on your European clothes, live in your European house, eat your European food, don't mingle with the locals. So, they mingle with the locals and they keep the church out at first. Because why are they there? Conquest or money? Money. What's going to make life easier in terms of making money with the locals? Good relations. Good relations, being able to interact with them. Now, later, this changes. As Europeans become more powerful, as the Industrial Revolution gives them better technology, Europeans are able to go from being friendly to being dominant. And that's when you're going to see some of these behaviors shift. You will see them become able to import European housing you will see them become better able to control their environment and therefore still be able to wear European clothes. You'll see them bring in the church and at that point have to dress and act like Europeans. And you will see them express frustration or disdain 
contempt for some of the local customs. Um, this quote comes out of your textbook. You may have seen it, you may not. Um, this is a great demonstration of showing how the European perspective shifts. Uh, this is from a British official in India. And you can tell very quickly that this is after the British have been there for a while. Because Sir Charles Napier says, the burning of widows is your custom. What's he talking about here? Sati. The burning of widows is your custom. So prepare the funeral pyre. But my nation, which is England, also has a custom. When men burn women alive, we hang them and confiscate all their property. So my carpenters shall therefore erect gibbets, which is what you hang people from. It's the wooden post that you hang the noose from. My carpenters shall therefore erect the gibbets on which to hang all concerned when the widow is consumed. Let us all act according to our national customs. So you go burn your widow and then we'll hang you for murder and take all your stuff. Let us all act as befits our national customs. Well, again, he's not being literal. He's not actually giving them permission to go kill a woman so that he can then kill them. He's more using it as a show of force, like, no, you're not going to kill her, because if you do, I'm going to act like British people do. And we execute murderers. Right, so what he's doing is he's strongly encouraging them not to perform the sati ceremony. That's when you burn the widow. Do you remember that? Okay. So that's when you see them actively suppress aspects of local culture. So it's kind of a change over time thing. In well, it depends on your culture. Again, it depends. If you are a Hindu and you adhere to the belief that Right. Well, it's also promoting women's rights because that belief is that the women can't survive without their husbands. Which is a Western notion. So I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm trying to get you to see both cultural perspectives. The Europeans are coming in and doing what they genuinely believe to be the better thing. But the problem is, and the reason that there is conflict, is that the place the Europeans are in, they disagree. They don't necessarily agree with Western culture and Western values. Emily? That's exactly the problem. Because like we learned about, sometimes with you know Sati, the widows went willingly. They had the religious belief that I need to go with my husband. Now, sometimes they're drugged. You're right. Sometimes they go unwillingly. But what you're talking about here is now a uniform British policy against Sati. We are going to stop all instances of it from happening, regardless of what the locals want. We know better than they do, is the new British mentality. When they first show up, it's, hey, the locals are pretty smart. They have good stuff. We can learn from them. Now it's locals are wrong, white people are right all the time. Yes? Uh huh. All right, any questions on anything else here? Yes? Uh huh. Exactly. Okay. So, reasons why the Europeans are eventually able to kind of do whatever they want. And I don't know if that color is making life difficult. Is that easier? Not really. Okay. All right. Good. All right. So reasons why Europeans are able to successfully exert their influence on all these foreign areas. A, they have access to lots of natural resources back in Europe and then with their colonies in the New World. 
That gives them lots of wealth. Lots of wealth means they have lots of opportunities for experimentation. And then thanks to the Industrial Revolution, all kinds of fun new toys to play with. So lots of resources, lots of wealth, lots of learning equals things like advances in chemistry, which gives them TNT, dynamite. Anybody doing ACDC in their head now? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, other things that it lets them do. Mobile artillery. The power of cannons, but far more port portable. Um, faster loading rifles. So instead of muzzle loaders using black powder, you now have rifle cartridges, bullets. What happens if you can shoot faster? Kill more people. Railroads. Now instead of horses being the fastest means of transportation, once you lay the track, you can literally carry tons of people and supplies wherever you want. And the same holds true on the water with steamships. What do you no longer have to rely on when you have a steamship? The wind. If it's a calm day, great. You get a better tan while you're on the deck of your steam-powered ship. You can go up rivers. You can go against currents. And you can carry a whole bunch of stuff. And then when we take some of these new weapons and we put them on a steamship. Now you are scary on the water. Right. Now you can sail anywhere and blow people up. All this technology then also allows them to keep themselves separate from the locals if they choose to. This gives them different building materials so they can build houses in places where you normally couldn't. They can suck the water out of marshes and build on them. They can redirect rivers. They can do all of these things and live in places that the locals couldn't. And having all of these things begins to develop something that we call the white man's burden. Europeans will begin to believe that they have an obligation, they have a burden, an obligation to civilize everybody else. In other words, European culture is the best, it is right, and everybody else should be like them. Right. They won't necessarily always promote it to the nth degree, but let me give you an example to show you how far reaching this idea is, and then we'll jump back. This is an advertisement for soap. Soap. And if you read the advertisement, it says, this is the first step towards lightening the white man's burden by teaching the virtues of cleanliness. Look at the picture. You got this poor half-naked savage kneeling down, graciously accepting a bar of soap. Life-changing. Life-changing. Pear's soap is a potent factor in brightening the dark corners of the earth as civilization advances while amongst the cultured of all nations, it holds the highest place as the ideal toilet soap. Toilet meaning bathroom, not toilet meaning toilet. It's a soap. And this is going to single-handedly bring civilization. So we're going to teach all these poor half-naked benighted heathens how to wash themselves. And that'll basically get rid of the dirt and make them cleaner slash more white. That's, a, that's some kind of amazing soap. Mine just gets rid of the germs. Some of you have probably heard of Rudyard Kipling, very famous poet and author. Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best you breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need, to wait in heavy harness, unfluttered fold and wild, your new-caught sullen peoples, half-devil and half-child. He's actually poking fun at the white man's burden saying, oh, it's a really good idea. Yeah, go send off all our best Europeans to the farthest corners of the globe to convince everybody else to be Europeans. Stupid idea. Way to go, Europe. Um, here's another one. 
from a European explorer who says while he's visiting Africa, right now the Congo is a blank, a fruitless waste. Sorry, we ran short on time. 